Earth number one. Earth number one. Who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Someone tell me. Solomon. And this is probably toward the end of Solomon's life. Now, someone, uh, Solomon lived a good life. He has, uh, he was the most wealthy man that, um, you know, some say ever lived. I don't know how we, how we compare that. We don't even know what all he had. But uh, in his day and time, anyway, he was the most wealthy man ever. And he was the wisest man that ever lived because God gave him that wisdom. God basically gave him a blank check. What's a blank check? You sign it and say whatever whatever number with however many zeros you want to put in it, you put in it. All right? Now you can do that all day long to my check and you ain't going to get a whole lot from it. Okay? Because <laughs> um, it, it only matters how much money is in the bank. That's how much you can get out. So you won't be able to put too many zeros after it. But when God gives you a blank check and you can ask for anything that you want, and he could have asked for great wealth, great riches, great popularity, but what did he ask for? Someone, uh, uh, two things. Wisdom and knowledge. knowledge. He had the wisdom and knowledge so that he could rule God's people well and wisely. And God said, you know what? Because you asked for wisdom and you did not ask for great wealth, I'll give you great wealth as well. And uh, he had everything you could think of. And uh, then he made some mistakes in his life. It all began with women. You girls cold over here? No, no. I, this, I this feeling like chilly for me. Yeah. That's terrible. We'll close that for a little bit. All right. So I think he's going to be a popsicle over here. <laughs> <laughs> someone, someone carry her out, please. She's stuck. But um, so he he had great wealth, great riches, but kind of messed it all up with the women in his life. Seven hundred wives, three hundred concubines. And, uh, a whole lot of other laws. And, uh, so, but toward the end of his life, okay, toward the end of Solomon's life, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. And, or he pens the book, God tells him what to write. And uh, he even says, in there, vanities of vanities, all is vanity, everything I've lived for, all the stuff I've had, it's all vanity, meaning empty and meaningless. He kind of he kind of looks back on his life and thinks about some things and challenges the people he's writing to to consider wisdom from an old man in his latter years to think about some things. And I've always loved verse number one, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now, what he's saying is, you know, remember, remember now, your creator, make decisions based upon what God would have you to do. Now, while you're young, before, before trials and tribulation come, before you make so many mistakes and so many evil, sinful decisions that the way of the world comes crashing down on you, and there may be limits what you can do for God. Before you have regrets, make some decisions to remember God in the days of your youth. I've always thought about this verse, and you know, I'm sure you could ask every adult in here, maybe even some of you teenagers, if you could go back in time, go back to your younger years, I don't know, with me back to my teenage years, and I'll be honest, I enjoyed my teenage years. My wife and I were talking the other day, and I think one of the kids, one of the kids said, oh, I can't wait to be a teenager. And my wife said, Oh, I never want to go back to my teen years again. I, I love to. I, I enjoyed my teen years. I was an idiot, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> but but there are a lot of things that I wish I could go back and change. And, and the decisions that I made that I wish I could go back and change. And I've often thought, as I just sought uh, sat and thought and reminisced to myself and meditated a little bit. I've often thought of some things in my life, regrets that I had, ways that I treated people or things that I did or things that I had opportunities to, to take advantage of but I didn't when I was young and now I wish that I had done those things. I wish I had learned to, to speak a different language or, or another language, not a different language, but another language when I was a kid or younger. Um, but it was easier. I wish that I had learned to play the guitar when I was younger. And a lot of things I wish that I had done, but I didn't. And um, uh, that's what 
Solomon here saying, he's thinking back and saying, no, remember your creator while you're young, because there's some things that I wish I could go back and change, but I cannot. I made a list here of some things that I wish that I could go back and, if God were given the opportunity today, to go back 20 years of my life, 25 years of my life, and make some changes, what would some of those changes be? Number one, I would choose to walk with God sooner than I did. I wasted a lot of years of my teen years, and I kind of, and I've mentioned this wrong, I kind of enjoyed or, or uh, took for granted the blessings that God was giving me because I was under the umbrella of my parents' relationship with God and the, the, um, the blessings that come with that. I was under the umbrella of the Christian school and the church here, and I was blessed by some of those things. And I kind of thought to myself, you know what, I don't need my own personal walk with God because my life's pretty good, and I'm not off in sin, and I'm not being affected by all that wickedness out there, per se. And I did not choose to have my own personal walk with God till much later in my life than I should have. And I wish I could go back. Now, I saw other people. I have uh, I had mentors and friends that I saw that they had a relationship with God, and I wanted that, but I was not willing to put forth the effort to have that relationship with God of my own. And I'm grateful for really it was spending time with Brother Greg Clark that that helped me, and that was probably my senior year, a uh, couple of years after that, that I began to uh, seek a walk with God of my own. I wish I knew that sooner. Number two, I would have taken full advantage of every opportunity to know God better. <clears throat> you know, I enjoyed camp when I was your age, but it wasn't for the right reason. Now, I'm not saying that enjoying camp for the fun and games is the wrong reason necessarily. I enjoy the fun and games. I'm looking forward to the fun and games. I'm looking forward to getting in the woods where no one's wearing a mask. Although well, I am considering the first night of camp passing out gloves and masks to everybody and making you wear them all week long just so you know what our retail people in this town feel like all day long having to wear a mask. No, I'm not going to do that. But, but I'm not going to afford to get out in the woods. I'm looking forward to get out in the lake and enjoying some good times, some competition, some preaching, some fellowship with you and others. And I am looking forward to that. But I'm, I am... In my latter years now, I am I am looking forward to getting to camp, and I'm looking forward to being fed by God's word this week. I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Justin preach and the other men that will be preaching. I'm looking forward to the afternoon sessions and the morning sessions where we'll be studying the book of First John. And I am I am looking forward to being fed through God's word and growing closer to God this next week. I wish that when I was a teenager, I had taken every opportunity to partake in most uh, more of those things that could have helped me to know God better. I wish I could have learned more from other people I knew over the years. That instead of just seeing them from a distance and knowing who they were, I wish that I had taken the time to learn who they were and why they were and how their relationship with God made them what they were and to know God better and how he works in other people. I wish I had come to church. Like I see many of you come every single week and you're eager to be here and you're taking notes and you're following and you're excited to be here. I'll be honest, I wasn't always excited to be in church when I was younger. Now, I kind of came sometimes just because it was what I was supposed to do. I wish I could go to camp again as a camper and get the opportunity that some of you have just to sit and to listen and to ask God. I hope that before you go, you'll ask God, God, would you please give me something I can hold on to this week? Uh, God, would you please speak to me in a very clear and direct way and show me what it is you want for my life in the future or show me what it is you want for my life now, God. I want you to speak to me this week. I would go to camp if I were a camper looking for God to do something in my life. If I could go back and change some things in my life, I would purpose to learn more from people that God's placed in my life. And I'm very grateful. Now, you know, as I get older, many of the people that have, have been an influence on my life are falling by the way, so not, 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 not falling to sin, but they're dying. They're, they're passing off the scene. 
Just this last week, I heard about a man, Salvador D'Alessandro, Salvador Giovanni, something, 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 D'Alessandro. It's like 14 names. But he went, he uh, uh, slipped off into eternity, went to be the Lord. I remember at our old church building, if you drive down College Road here, and uh, there's an accounting business, I forget what it's called, but something accounts. There's an accounting business there on College Road just past um, Joy School and Wedgwood there, left-hand side. That's our old church, that's where I grew up. And um, I grew up in that building there. And after we moved from that building to this building, we still owned that building. And Salvatore D'Alessandro lived in that building for a while. He did our maintenance and our janitor around here. And he had two buddies with him, young men named Keith and Tevin Baker, who became dear friends of mine over the years. And I remember going to that building over there and spending time with them and eating with them. And all over the walls of that building, he had maps of Alaska. And he had big plans of passing out tracks and going to villages. And I, I always admired his heart for people. He was a soul winner and he loved people. He had a desire for God to use him. Now, he had a past and he had some other things that kind of hindered him from from reaching his full potential, I believe, but he was a man that had a heart for God, and I wish I could go back to those days and learn more from him. The things that God has done in his life and the things that God has brought him through. There's a lot of people in my life, I think back at camps that I went to, and events I went to, and I can think of things that I learned from people that I wish I could go back and purpose to learn for more. I remember when Brother O'Gallon was my cabin counselor years ago at Twin Bears. And uh, he was the, the, uh, the uh, first counselor I had. I really have a whole lot of memories of and some of the things that we did and the way he did it. And, and I would often, as I became a counselor at, at camp, I would often think, how would Father Ogala do this? I'm, I'm going to think of things that I learned from him by watching him. Learn from those people that God brought in your life. I remember when Don Coghill ran the camp out there. Back when we had kids camp first for oh, hell week. <laughs> and then we had teen camp after that. And I remember watching him sometimes 6 o'clock in the morning, walking around the lake, praying for camp that week. No, and I was just a rebellious teenager, and I was just there because there was a fun thing to do, and I was just there to get out of whatever I was doing at home, and I was just there to hang out. And I watched him walk around that lake and pray for us as teenagers. And I watched him weep over some young men that were having a difficult time at camp. And I learned some things from him. But Brother Greg Clark was the bus captain, or pastor out there, and the youth pastor. I remember learning things from him. And for the Lewis Roberts, I just talked to him this last week. And uh, he called me. And uh, I'm grateful that I had an opportunity to learn things from them. But I wish I could go back and purpose to learn more from them. You have an opportunity this week to learn from some people. I'm looking forward. How many of you know teenagers. How many of you know who Justin and Rachel Smith are? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you really know them well at all and spend any time with them? None of you really. You, you, you were there when you were a little, my little brat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they they came to our camp several, uh, several years in a row when the back row was in camp and were and, uh, campers and the older, the older folks were in camp. But then uh, he was an evangelist and then he became a pastor and he wasn't able to travel up here uh, as much, so he hasn't been here in several years, probably six years or so for camp. So they're looking forward to coming to the same church again, but to be able to get to know and reach a whole gener uh, different generation of young people, I'm looking forward to getting you get to know them. But it'd be good for some of you ladies to get to, you know, get to know Miss Rachel and spend some time with her and ask questions and learn from her. I'm going to ask you. Her and Brother Justin can kind of share their testimony. They prayed for a child for years and years and years and years and did tests and tried this and tried this and tried that. And they pretty much thought we'll never have children. And then God blessed them with a the little girl. And uh, they have some stories to tell about just, uh, just how God's blessed them and has, has proven himself strong in their life. And it'd be good for you to get alongside them instead of just playing games all the time. Nothing wrong with that. Or walk on to Brother Justin. Say, Brother Justin, what kind of decisions did you make when you were a teenager to help you get to where you are today? I'm sure he's going to share some of that with us. Um, and we know uh, someone who's been to camp with him before. Where did he work with him as a teenager? Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen. 
And he'll tell you some stories, I'm sure, about his Dairy Queen days. And he still loves Dairy Queen this day. If you go to the States with him uh, and spend time with him, there will be a point where you'll go to Dairy Queen with Justin and you will get some ice cream with him. But he has some stories about where did Brother, where did Brother Dan work? Taco Bell. With a bunch of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there were some decisions. There were some decisions that Brother Dan made as a teenager that helped him get to where he is today. And for some of you, it would be good for some of you to ask some questions, get to know some of these people, sit down with Miss Paul, ask her some questions, and learn from these people that God has placed in your life. Next week or two weeks from now, three weeks from now, we're going to serve it. And I hope, I hope that many of you will go. But uh, uh, I don't think, I don't think some of you understand the privilege that you have of going to a camp there where there are several pastors that gather there and you have the opportunity to sit down with them, pastors' wives, and just get to know them and talk to them. Caleb Sinareski was a, a, a teenager in camp not too many years ago when I went for the first time and today he's pastoring a church bringing a group of teenagers to camp. And he could be a help and encouragement to some of you if you would just take the time to learn from those people that God has placed in your life for a reason at this time. Number four, build relationships with people outside my regular clique. Everybody has a group of friends that you pretty much spend all your time with. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But you should be willing to, you know, don't be such a clique or don't form such a tight bond that nobody else can come in and everybody else is shunned because maybe they're different. They have the same interest as you. Learn to welcome those that may be different but just need someone to spend some time with and someone to love on them. Don't just hang out with your two friends. Make some new friends. Yeah. I wish I could go back. There's the, to this day, I live in uh, live with guilt. That there's a man in our church today. He's here right now. I'm sure downstairs. There's a family comes every every week. He serves in the church. He and I were about the same age. I think I may be one year older than he is. Something like that. I forget the details. But he did not fit into the clip that I hung out with in junior high, high school. His family was a little different. They dressed a little different. They acted a little different. And we ridiculed him and never accepted him and never received him into our little group. And he always kind of wanted to be with us. He was probably better off not being with us, uh, to be honest. But as a teenager, we did not treat him well. And I have I have asked him numerous times as an adult to, you know, to forgive me for the way I treated him. And he's told me several times, hey, you know, it's fine, it didn't, you know, it didn't affect me. But to this day, I wish that I, I could have gotten to know him better and uh, learned some things from him if I had just learned to swallow my pride and get rid of my stupidity and learn to welcome other people. Mm -hmm. Well, Caleb Compton will be here uh, for camp. Coming from the village, some of you may know him, some of you may not know him very well, but it'd be good for you to welcome him in, learn, learn things about him, and uh, don't, don't, uh, don't make them fight to get into your little group. You've been coming for a while, and you have your group of friends. Don't let them be outsiders. We have Grace, Gracie is her name, Gracie Carrot coming in to land tonight. I guess it's during our, I know they're going to be here for church tonight, but they don't land until 8.45 tonight. She's going to be in church one Wednesday and one Sunday morning in the head of the camp. She will know nobody there. And it'd be good for some of you young girls, some of you young girls, and some of you older girls to put your arm around her. She's been struggling with this move, moving from Huna, uh, whatever friends that she has, coming here to a strange place, a strange church. It'd be good for somebody to welcome her in, learn her name, walk up to her, make, Make it a point to walk up to her and greet her and befriend her. Same with the great girls, Madison and um, um, Naomi. And you know, uh, new church, new surroundings. It'd be good for you to get around them and encourage them and welcome them into your little group. But you know, learn to build relationships with other people. Number five, help those that are younger, struggling, or weaker than you. You know, I... 
I've seen it today, I was working with these young men, several of these young men worked with me this week, and we worked at my house, I worked with my dogs, so. And uh, they did a lot of work out of my place, trying to help me with the outside, getting me ready for Justin Rachel coming in, and getting ready for summertime, and whatever else. And then we went over to Mrs. Bethany's house, one of our widows in the church, and we helped her. Any of you friends with Aurora, Mrs. Bethany's granddaughter? Any of you? Um, didn't that little girl that they just put no. on her vest? No. Okay. So if you see her, okay, I don't know if she'll be in church, but I, you know, I'm trying to get her to come to church. You know, it, it, it's got what I'm talking about. She comes to church, but not regularly, but often. And none of our girls know who she is. She comes to sit with her grandmother, but none of us really know who she is because no one has reached out of our group and gone to walk with her. I tried to encourage her to come to camp, but she just... You know, she told me, well, I just don't know anybody, and I don't know, so I'm trying to encourage her to come, but Mrs. Bethany wants her to come, but she's with me. So pray for Aurora. I don't know what her last name is. What's Tanya's last name? I think it's Stuttgart. Stuttgart. Yeah. Aurora. Pray for Aurora. <laughs> 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 so, then she just turned 14, and so if you see her, if you know her, contact her, but uh, pray for her. But, um, <clears throat> you know, my whole life now, is pretty much centered around working with people who are younger than me, weaker than me in certain areas sometimes, or struggling in different areas. And you know, it's it's something I wish I wish I had done more when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Now God blessed me, put me in the home of a preacher, and I had every opportunity to know God and to learn some things and to teach other people. But unfortunately, I did not take advantage of that. In my younger years, I did not encourage those that I was around, but I wish I had done that more as a teen to encourage other people to do right. I wish I had done a little more, a little less of keeping my mouth shut about what they're doing and a little more speaking up, hey, 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 what you're talking about there is not right. What you're doing is not right. Why don't you come over here and let's do what's right. Why don't you, why don't you help me serve the Lord over here? I wish I encouraged more people to do what's right. Realize, teenagers, that there are people around you watching you. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, don't turn there, God comes looking for Cain and Abel, and he sees Cain. What has Cain just done to his brother? He just killed him, just murdered him. And God comes to uh, Cain and hey, hey, where's Abel at? Cain's response was, and the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Is it my job to watch out for my brother? Yes. I want to answer that question for you. Yes. Mm. You are your brother's keeper. You are your sister's keeper. It is our, our responsibility, our job as brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage each other and to help each other. I took a picture. If I, if it wasn't so complicated, I put it on the screen here. But at my house the other day, we had lunch. And then the guys were kicking the hacky sack around and fishing out hateful remarks to each other. <laughs> it was just a joy to sit back and listen to them riding each other and calling each other losers and hateful, hateful names. It was wonderful. All in good fun. But I have a picture that shows all the guys standing around and I th I, and Rocco right in the middle of the ball. He's kind of <laughs> he had no idea what they were all doing, what they were talking about, but he's you know, right there in the middle. He's like, I'm here. What are we doing? We're playing hacky sack? I don't know what hacky sack is. You know what? He just, he just wants to be with them. You, you teenagers, the younger people, they look up to you. They want to be just like you. I've told you numerous times about when I was in school years ago, when I was in fifth grade, I think it was. And I had to go get a soda at the other other building, and I had to walk through the high school classroom. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is how, yes, and the seats aren't attached. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have lockers. <laughs> I had a square box or a, a hole with the, made of plywood and a hook underneath it. They had lockers with doors and padlocks. They had such valuable stuff in there. They had to lock it up. <laughs> my snow, my snowsuit just hung on a hook in my classroom. These guys were cool. And when they would come out to recess and play, 
I didn't want to play with any of us. Here's my soccer. No, but I'll never forget walking through that classroom instead of looking around. I'm going to be here one day. But I got there and I realized I did it. It's so cool here. But young people, they look up to you, they want to be just like you. There's several, I won't mention names, but there's several. I'm working on a message of along these lines. There's several young people here that my boys will mention your name. Well, someone's going to be here. Where's so-and-so? You know why? Because they like you. They look up to you. And girls, there's young ladies that look up to you. And, uh, whether they be teenagers or young girls, and realize that God's given you the opportunity to be a help and a blessing and an encouragement to those young people. Don't neglect the opportunity you have. You may be a life-changing a life-changing instrument that God could use in somebody's life, or you could be a life-destroying inst uh, yeah. uh, instrument that somebody could use. Well, they're doing wrong. I might as well do wrong, too. I've been looking up to them, and they're rebelling against their parents, and they have an attitude. Maybe I'll be like them one day. Or you could be one who would encourage those that you're around. Galatians 6 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bring evil people down, lift them up. The campus next week, I really enjoyed last year how we had every cabin was a a a, uh, a, a team. We're gonna do almost the same thing, a little bit different, but for the most part the same thing. And I'm looking forward to cabins. Working together as a team. There's always a weak link. In every group, there's a weak link. Hmm. And if you don't know who the weak link is, get you. <laughs> Everybody else knows that you haven't figured out yet, okay? But we all, we all have different strengths. We all have different weaknesses. And we need to encourage each other in our weaknesses and use our strengths to help those that are around us. I wish, I wish I had done that when I was younger. Number six. I wish I would have done more to create a team atmosphere for everyone when I was younger. And I mentioned that one young man's name that, uh, you know, when I was young, I was, we, uh, we often avoided him. You know what it was? It was pride. I'll never forget, we were, we had junior church over in the Joy, no, Wedgwood, Wedgwood uh, Hotel. Our church was kind of small, the building was kind of small. And uh, so um, our bus, uh, all of our buses would drop the kids off at Wedgwood years ago. And we had some buildings, some rooms up there we'd use. Then we'd have all the buses drop through about the Joy School, and we'd use the school as our junior church and Sunday school classes. And um, uh, then we bought this building, we came over here, we combined them all. And I remember hearing that this young man, uh, I want to use my words wisely here, this young man that we all picked on, his family was going over to my best friend's house. Because my best friend, I used to come over to my house, stand over for dinner. And I got, you know, I got to play with him, or you know, show him around. My parents wanted me to be nice to him, and he he didn't. Uh, uh, he had told me about it, he didn't want to do it. So that next Sunday, that was like Friday or Saturday night. That next Sunday, I showed up to church, knowing that that night before, or the uh, uh, this guy had been to my best friend's house. My best friend wasn't there that Sunday, and this guy shows up to me. That we always made fun of. And he asked, hey, where's so-and-so? Asking about my best friend. I don't know. I haven't seen him. Oh, let's look up. Okay, I went to his house yesterday. He was telling about some things that he did with him. And he was looking for him. You know what I thought? Oh, I guess you ain't so bad. My best friend can be your friend. I guess I can be your friend. And I sat with him that Sunday. That Sunday, my best friend wasn't there. My little clique wasn't there that Sunday. So I sat with this other kid that I felt was beneath me, unfortunately. And we had a good time that Sunday, playing together and, you know, being there in junior church and doing whatever it is. The next Sunday, my best friend was back, or that next Wednesday. And so we avoided him again. And I remember this day, the exact words he said to me one day. He said, Dave, but how come you were friends with me last week and this week you're not? To this day, that... that haunts me that I, I, would, I would reject someone like that. Just because he looked different, acted a little different, his family was different. Now he's a brother in Christ. I, I consider him a friend. But I can't go back and change any of that. 
It'd be great if you could, at camp, in church, in your Sunday school class, form a team atmosphere where, you know what, we're all different, but we're all on the same team, and we'll all get together, and when you're discouraged, I'll do what I can to lift you up and encourage you, and when I'm discouraged, you can encourage me, and we'll forget about any differences we may have, and we'll just all get along and serve the Lord together. Number seven, I wouldn't criticize or find fault. You know, it's easy when you're young or you don't run anything, it's easy to criticize everything that comes along. But then when you get older and you become a parent, which is something you often criticize, you realize, you know what? My dad's job was harder than I thought it was when I was a kid. My mom's job was harder than I thought it was when I was a kid. You know what? My pastor's job, I realized as I've uh, worked in the ministry and now work with people, I realized it can be far more discouraging and far more difficult than I thought it was when I was younger. When you come to camp, there may be a meal served that you don't like. There is no more picky eater than yours truly. Just ask my wife, she does it all the time. I, now, if I am paying for it, if I am buying it, I want it to be just so. I like my pancakes cooked just a certain way. They need to be cooked lightly, I don't want them dark. My syrup needs to be heated up. <laughs> you laugh, but my wife nukes my syrup when she puts it on my pancakes. Because I have a wonderful wife. And if you're a wonderful wife, you'll nuke your husband's pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> nuke his syrup. I'm just, I'm just very, the way I eat it, I like, I, you know. But if I go to your house and you serve me cold syrup, guess what? I will eat it and I will enjoy it and I will have a pile on my face. I'm not that. This turf is cold, and we got a nuke my syrup program. You know, I'm not going to complain about you, don't criticize. Eat the food, pass up what you don't like, eat what you like, and realize that whoever it was that made it, it may not be made like your mama would make it, but just eat it. Or pass it up and don't eat it, but don't criticize everything. If there's a game that's played that you don't like, Aww. guess what? So what? Just play it. Just play it and have a good time. You know, some of the some of the games you asked me, Nehemiah, some of the games that we talk about reminisce the most about were games that when we played them, we didn't like them. <laughs> <laughs> ask any ask any older person at camp this next week about knock your socks off. <laughs> every every camper hated that game. But that's what we talk about all the time. And, see, and if you just learn to just get, you know, learn to play the game and just have a good time, you'd be surprised how much fun you can have. And you'll make a memory uh, that you'll laugh about later on and curse the guy that ran the game and uh, have, have a good time. You may not like every person that's put in your cabin. Hey, hey, it, it, is, it would be impossible. I'm the one, I'm the one that divides everybody up, and there's a reason for that. So if anybody gets mad or is upset at somebody who's mad at me, I can, I can handle that. Sarah. Exactly. <laughs> because I love your counselors. You may not like everybody that can, uh, in your camp. You're not going to complain about it and criticize. You may, you may work a job, and your boss may make a decision that you don't like. Guess what? You've never been a boss. Mm, it's a shame. It's a shame that a, a guy will go to Safeway and get a job as a courtesy clerk, bagging groceries and getting carts, and he will complain in the break room or complain out in the parking lot about how terrible his boss is. When his boss started 20, 30 years ago as a courtesy clerk and has worked his way up to a manager, but the 14 year old teenager knows how to run Safeway a lot better than the manager does, and he will criticize him every chance he gets because. His boss didn't give him the time off he wanted, or his boss made him wear an apron. <laughs> I had to wear an apron to sing, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, had to wear an apron at, 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 uh, at work or wherever. Don't, don't criticize people in church. Don't criticize your leaders for every decisions that they made. Why don't you pray for them? Mm -hmm. Why don't you pray for them? You know, I mean, you know who it is who often complains to me about the way I do something? The people that don't do anything. Right. They're the ones that have all the answers. It never fails. Nehemiah, Chad, we do a project here at church, we build something, we put something together. There will always be somebody <laughs> who 
who will come to me out and you know, Brother Dave, you could have done it this way. You could have done it this way. I said, wait, where were you last week? <laughs> you could have used all of your wonderful wisdom last week. But no, you were off four wheeling or you were off at your job or you were off doing that. Hey, we were here doing it. So we did what we had with what we had with the knowledge that we had. You know what? Why don't you just say, Brother Dave, thanks for getting that job done instead of criticizing how it was done. Amen. It's always easier to criticize how somebody else did what you were not willing to do. <laughs> just praise them. You know what? Thank you for doing whatever it is you did. Counselor, thank you for waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning for that prayer meeting yesterday. That was wonderful. I slept the whole thing. It was wonderful. <laughs> you know? You may make a stupid decision, but pray for them. You know, it's not easy being a parent. No. I've learned that. I thought I had all the answers <laughs> before I had kids. Just beat them good. Just the more you whoop them, the more they'll. You, I remember those speeches. <laughs> 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 you can straight, you know, solve all the problems, and God gave me Rocco. And I realized beating kids is not, it's really about the answer to all your problems. I can beat that kid, and 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 he comes back for more. <laughs> he, just en he just enjoys it. Okay? But you just need to, you know, trust and believe in your authorities and believe in the decisions they make. They're making those decisions with the best intentions that they have. Nobody is trying to ruin your day. Pastor's not trying uh, uh, by having a certain pastor's not trying to to, to defy the government. Oh, uh, 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 forget the governor. We're just going to do everyone. No, he's trying to make decisions. There is no answer in this book as to how to handle the COVID-19 and all these stupid mandates that are out there. There is nothing in here that tells how to do that. So you have to make decisions based upon the best knowledge that you have and the wisdom that God gives you. And no matter what decision you make, somebody will criticize. That's right. You're going to say, God, whatever you want. Well, I'm going to do what you want me to do and trust God with the outcome. Trust your authorities and just encourage them and pray for them. Number eight, appreciate the time and work others have put in. You know, when I became, uh, came on staff here and began teaching other stuff, I, I began to appreciate the things that Brother Rod here did as he worked on his staff and he taught school. And I began to realize just how much work it was to teach school here and to prepare and all that good stuff. I re I've learned over the years how uh, to appreciate Pastor uh, when he had uh, uh, to preach sometimes three times on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And for a while, for a few months, he preached three times on Sunday morning, two times on Sunday night, and once on Wednesday and once on Thursday when we couldn't fit in our building. And now I have to preach three times a week and just about kill them. The study and the preparation and it, uh, learn to appreciate what other people, the effort other people put in and appreciate all their work. I appreciate with the graph. Now that it's my responsibility, I have ministry responsibilities and I have building responsibilities. And this last week, when I wanted to be prepared for camp, guess what I was doing? I had a toilet off the wall, up to my elbows up in the toilet, pulling other people's fecal matter and toilet paper out of a toilet so it would flush properly. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, ministry, this is wonderful. And I'm glad I signed up for this. You know, and, and, you know to be able to juggle those things and watch him with a drop as he led ministry uh, responsibilities here and had a building project here in this building here. And now it's just my job to, to, to coordinate work projects to get supplies done. And it's helping to appreciate what other the, the effort other people have put in. Yeah. Number nine. I we going to go back to camp and look for God or something great in my life. Go there with a pad and paper to God, I want you to do something in my heart and my life. Number ten, pray for others in my youth group and help them do what's right. Unfortunately, in my young years, I did not help too many people do what's right. I was more of a discouragement than encouragement. I wish I'd go back and change that. Number 11, and I'm done. I wish I would have responded to God's working in my life sooner. For about three years, I knew God was calling me to preach, calling me to the ministry, but I had my own plans. God, I came to that. I have my own plan, my own work I ought to do, and I have my own uh, agenda. Don't wait till later. Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, my spirit shall always strive with men. That opportunity to serve God, opportunity to be saved, may not always be there. Teenager, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, 
Trust Christ now. Amen. Open your heart and can ask God, 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 is this my opportunity? Maybe you've been having doubt after doubt after doubt after doubt. We're talking about some of that at camp, I believe, this week. But ask God, God, am I truly saved? Do I know? Do I know that I know that I know that I have a Savior and my sins are forgiven? Learn to follow Him. Walk with God now as a teenager. Don't waste, don't waste your years doing your own thing. And you say, well, maybe when I get to be an adult, I'll start to serve God. You know how many people I know that have wasted their lives and said they're so far from God, they wouldn't have to find them if they had to. Mm -hmm. Their lives were a mess. If I could go back to teenager, I would shake each one of you and say, I wish you'd wake up mm -hmm. and realize there are consequences down this road that you're heading. I'm not saying one of you are heading down a road of drugs and alcohol and immorality, but every one of us here has some tendency to we do not get a hold of them in our age now, in our young age or uh, where we are now, it could lead to something far worse. Every head battery right close. Every head battery right close. 